You know, in a like a 10 minute shot, you can't say everything you want to say. So we were talking about cremation. I think I neglected to say that the funeral service and the eulogy, first of all, the eulogy is the most important servant the priest will give ever. And secondly, the funeral service is, a, is where you have closure and if someone is cremated and they, they can't go to the church, they're at the cemetery and someone was here and both gone, just ashes, how do you reconcile this living human being and then his death, or her death. I think that the ritual of funeral is important in order for the families, etc., to have a kind of closure and to say a, a goodbye. What, Lynn? I said for sure. And I, I, I've, I've had some experience with people that had had the cremation, and I remember several of them had breakdowns because they really never had a. There was nothing in between. Well, he's here now. He's gone. And poof. And you know, you it, it the whole ritual itself the meal afterwards, all of that goes into helping a family transition uh, into the loss of a loved one. So besides whatever theological basis there is, there is or is not for cremation, the human dimension, which is very important, should never be underestimated. A person needs to say goodbye to a loved one in a proper way. Secondly, when I spoke about transfiguration last week, I should have added, if I didn't, that this particular feast demonstrates and shows to us the role of, of the spiritual life leading to deification and that the possibility of the reception of grace so that one's soul may be illumined by the Holy Spirit. And secondly, the blessing of the grapes Plus, it's the harvest time and at the end of the summer and uh, the grapes are a great symbol of... But it's also the fruition of, uh, of those seeds that went into, a, became a grapevine and had grapes that we could eat and enjoy. It also demonstrates and shows that everything in this world can be transformed. And those grapes can become the wine that you use in the Eucharist. So everything in this, on this earth 
This is, the, you know, the, we look forward to the new earth and the new heavens and the, after the, with the second coming. And we believe that we have a possibility to transform our lives here and now. That's why this feast has so much significance in our Orthodox, in our Orthodox Church. And I really thought I should clarify that a little bit more than what I did uh, last week. And Lynn and I were talking about uh, uh, reincarnation. And uh, so that's a little subject I want to talk about briefly. First of all, what are your thoughts on reincarnation? I believe in it. <laughs> You're a heretic. I understand. I understand in many respects I'm a heretic. Um, I believe that in one way or another we are incarnated. I'm not sure how. I know that life goes on. And I don't think that we come back as somebody else. I think we come back as ourselves again. Um, in another, maybe in another body or in another realm. But I, I think if you believe life goes on, you believe in reincarnation. You're reincarnated. You're maybe not, not on this earth. And maybe on this earth, I don't know, but I believe in some form of reincarnation. Um, what about the resurrection, for heaven's sakes? What about it? We believe in the resurrection of the body. Life goes on. And the king doesn't mean to be reincarnated over again. Well, that'll all stop when, when, when the second coming happens. That'll all stop. The, that's been a debate. And people have tried to use the scripture. Edward Casey was a, was a proponent of uh, reincarnation. And I can't tell you how many discussions I had in, in my church in Montreal with people that really held down to this belief. And the reason, I, I'll say personally, I could never accept reincarnation is because it's an escape hatch from, from one's doing their best to reach as much close to perfection as possible on earth. But what about all these people that have had past life regressions and, and there's some truth to their, they, they, they connect with them um, on a very deep level, on a gut level, they connect with their past lives uh, and, and it's a real experience for them. How do you explain that? Because I think your genes have a memory and those memory genes. I know that when I went to my grandfather's village in Biskinta, Lebanon, I went right to his house. I, I felt that I, I, I lived there before. It was as familiar to me as 221 Barrett Street in Syracuse, New York, or 100 Ryder Avenue, our, our last address. And I, I believe our Genes carry, carry those memories, and they're passed on to us. And it's, it's the belief that we are created in the image and likeness of God. We're unique persons. And to think that, first, let's say a married couple. I die and you die. What, who, we're supposed to see each other after death and know each other after death. How does that work if, if you have another life somewhere else? We'll never see, that's it. We'll never see you again. So for me, reincarnation, uh, I don't think it has any, any uh, real foundation. And I think people don't take into account the genes that have a memory. Don't you think we continue to grow in the afterlife? Though? Yeah. Gregory of Nyssa, the great church father, said, that eternal life is the eternal growth of the person in the knowledge of God. 
that is a continuous growth even after we die in in grace and into the into the uh, experience of God. I, I believe that we that there's an afterlife. Of course, sometimes you see these little kids sit down on the piano and start playing a concerto. <laughs> where, did they, where did they learn that from? They're five years old. Well, I think it's part of the the memory gene of someone in their family that was a, a pianist, and that kid inherited that gene. It, it, it's subliminal, and it comes out in this kid. I don't think that he was uh, born again. Well, that's debatable, <laughs> as far as I'm concerned. I want to thank you all for listening to us and for being with us. Um, we'll be back again soon. God bless you.